Once again, we're glad to welcome you, friends and colleagues, dear guests. I think it's an art object working. An art object is part of the exhibition that works on several levels. Well, the moderators of the forum are us again, Denis Belkevich and Anastasia Volkova, Art Rue Ag Agency. We've already attracted your attention to the exhibition, which is called Without Limitations. It's right behind you. The exhibition is without limitations. You all got the folders with booklets. At the last page, there's a map, the map of the exhibition, which describes the areas of the library that you can visit during the coffee break and the lunch break, or you can leave this session. The exhibition will be open for two days, and tomorrow at 10 a.m. there will be a special session where there will be seven curators of the art schools and the exhibitors. They will discuss the issues of art education. Last Yesterday we talked to the teachers. Tomorrow we'll be speaking with curators and the students. And one of the moderators of that session will be Dmitry Gutov, a Russian artist. Otherwise, you'll have to get up early tomorrow again. If you are strong enough to turn on the TV after yesterday, you see that the news were on the TV last night, and they went to blogs, websites, and multiplied on the internet. Yes, that is truly so. You can't imagine how many posts, uh, comments, and retweets appeared on the web. We are starting our new session, Art Criticism in the Epoch of New Technologies. I would like to emphasize it's for the first time that we have collected the leading world art bloggers and specialists in social networks. Kark Vartanyan, Hyper Allergic Project, Samantha Kao, Red Book Studio, Shanghai, China, Astrid Mania, Art Critic. Berlin, Will Brandt, Artfact City Editor, New York, Giuseppe Barbieri, Head of the Multimedia Department of Kafoskari University, Venice, Claire Solari, Expert in Social Communication, Paris, and Florence Astant, Curator, Art Blogger, Editor of the Catalog Internet Publication, France. And the main contributor for the first session will be an art blogger and an editor, Julia Kaganski. Thank you for having me here today, and thank you to the Peter Kondolowski Foundation for organizing this gorgeous conference. Um, I found the conversations that took place here so far to be most illuminating and inspiring, and I hope that we can continue that trend with our session here today. Um, I'd start off by asking how many of you guys use Twitter? <laughs> because if you do, um, we've been tweeting throughout the conference using, using the hashtag artcrit. 
Um, and if you'd like to join us in tweeting and follow along, please do. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, please disregard this remark. Um, I also must confess that I had an entirely different presentation prepared for today's panel, but given the conversations that took place yesterday, I thought it better to speak less about how art criticism takes place on the web and perhaps focus my introductory remarks about why this conversation is necessary to take place online and why those web-based discussions are still valid despite taking place outside of the academic context, as it were. Um, the internet is an open, democratic, multimedia platform that allows each of us, regardless of our status or qualifications, to have a voice, to express an opinion, to connect with a robust, global, intellectual community, and to reach a wide general audience. It's an incredibly powerful tool, and it serves both amateurs and experts alike, which can be disconcerting for many, but it needn't be. I think we all know the internet is vast, but here are some quick statistics to give us a sense of scale. There are nearly 2 billion internet users on the web. As of May 2010, uh, there were 152 million blogs. On average, about 120 million tweets per day take place on Twitter. And on average, about 35 hours of video are being uploaded to YouTube every minute. And 30 billion pieces of content are shared on Facebook each month. Um, these numbers are staggering and kind of hard to fathom. But um, I think you know, it's important to keep in mind because with newspapers all over the world eliminating art criticism from their coverage and many print publications closing their doors altogether, can we really afford to ignore such a huge publishing and distribution platform as the internet affords us? The conversations online are happening with or without us. We can either choose to engage and attempt to be stewards of those conversations to help shape and elevate them, or we can bury our heads in the sand, deem this discourse as base and beneath us, and risk becoming increasingly alienated from our quickly disappearing audience. By not bringing critical discussions of art to the web, we are isolating ourselves from the very contemporary culture that gives shapes to the contemporary art of which we write. And as more and more artists begin to engage with and respond to the effects of social media and digital technology, how well equipped will we be to analyze and evaluate their work as critics if their sensibilities are completely foreign to us? Now, I'm not saying that the web can ever replace the kind of deeply thoughtful, insightful, academic criticism that so many of us hold dear. I will concede that it's often difficult to consume that type of content through the glow of the computer screen with the many distractions of email, Facebook, and Twitter, and so forth, pinging in the background. Attention on the web is hard to capture, and it's even harder to keep. Внимание в интернете очень сложно удержать, а еще более сложно. Criticism on the internet privileges shorter, more conversational material, and places a higher premium on visual content like images and video. But I would argue that the two forms are not mutually exclusive, but are rather part of one self-sustaining ecosystem, and that the latter form is actually becoming more and more necessary to ensure that the former survives. The internet makes it possible for us to take art criticism down from its pedestal and make it more accessible to the general public. This is not a travesty, it's a necessity. Judging from the discussions that took place yesterday, I'm sure some of you may think that this notion is flawed or foolish, or that it's not the role of the art critic to engage the public in this way. But I believe it's absolutely imperative for the profession's survival. Who are we writing for, each other? How much longer will we be able to go on in this insular fashion if the greater world at large cares nothing for our practice? This isn't a question of dumbing things down. It's a matter of adapting to a new, radically different, and hugely important communication medium. It's a matter of supplementing our existing practice with new practices that are consistent with the requirements and rules of engagement of this new medium. It's about being open to and promoting conversation. It's about creating a gateway into our world. I'd like to end my introductory remarks with a quote by the American art critic Jerry Saltz, who, in addition to being a three-time Pulitzer Prize-nominated critic for New York Magazine, also maintains an active Facebook page and Twitter account and engages with his audience regularly in the comments therein. In an interview with Art Info a few weeks ago, he said, 
I want to speak about art more directly and more often to anyone who will listen, anyone who loves, is interested in, or skeptical of art. Even if they didn't go to art school or don't know the lingo and the secret handshakes, I want an inversion to take place. Instead of the one writing to the many in a hierarchical critic on top structure, I want to be involved with the many speaking to one another, coherently, with pleasure, provocation, vulnerability, humor, and passion. I'm not interested in being the main speaker. I want to hear, listen, heed. I want writing to form moving communities and temporary bonds, be a vow, create a chorus, be a crucible of doubt and agency, be a living text of different compulsions. I want to enter what Cezanne called a shimmering chaos. Many have criticized me, and this is dumbing down the conversation. They could be right. From my experience, these conversations have never been dumbed down or anti-intellectual. Anyway, these last five or six years have been the richest of my critical life. And I'd like to echo his sentiments and give the floor to my fellow panelists to give their opinions. Um, you know, do you think that we are losing something by engaging on the web, or are there new opportunities as well as new challenges being presented? Hello. Hi. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think uh, there's a lot of perceptions people have about art bloggers and people who write online that aren't necessarily true. And one of, one of the perceptions is a lot of, lot of us don't come from the art world um, in certain ways. And I, myself, for instance, I have a graduate degree in art history, but I, ch I choose to write online as my medium. And I feel like what we do online comes from a tradition of art criticism that you know might be a little bit older than a lot of the criticism we're seeing now. Uh, many people attribute the birth of art criticism to Diderot, who of course the 18th century French Enlightenment intellectual. And if you read his art criticism from 200, 250 years ago, you realize how it's a lot more conversational and it's a much more engaging and less theoretical than a lot of the art criticism we see today. And I feel like what we do comes from that tradition. I mean, when he's walking through the French salons, he's talking about what he's seeing, what he's experiencing, um, what he comes upon. He adds anecdotes. He adds little comments about his everyday, that artwork, that artist, what he heard. And that is a lot closer to what we do than probably a lot of the other criticism that goes on in many of the art publications and newspapers nowadays. And I think that returns our criticism in some way to its roots. We are trying to expand the conversation, and I think that's what we're really interested in. The people that often read us will be people that, you know, well, I mean, we're being linked to by publications that aren't interested in only art. And I think that's what makes the public for art more interested. I mean, they want to know about, oh, there's a really cool show going on at that museum. You know, the truth is, how many people subscribe to all art magazines? How many people read every single review? How many people do all that? Well, we make it very um, easy to digest for people to share on Facebook. We make it easy to digest so people can get a little sense of what's going on. They can see photos. They can watch videos. And I think that's a really important part of the conversation that hasn't been happening in the art world for a very long time. And I think so many other culture industries do that, like music, like movies, like all these different things. And if we're going to really create a robust, healthy art world, we have to be able to have all those different levels. We have to be able to engage the person who doesn't know very much. The 14-year-old who, you know, doesn't know about art but is a little scared to ask people but is Googling something and wants to learn. But also the people um, who really don't have a full, you know, aren't full-time devoted to art and want to know what to go see this weekend. We want to make it approachable, and I think that's really an important part of this equation, and I think the online art world could really contribute to that. And um, I think it's really important. Krak, Krak Vartanian. Yes. Krak Vartanian, the creator and the main editor of Hydrologic.com blog. While the participants, while the panelists decide who will be speaking, 
I would remind you that in your notepads, there are nominations for the prize. Three out of five candidates are here, and it depends on how they present themselves. And after you've studied the blogs, I hope most people in this room are subscribers to those electronic media. And their today's presentations will allow you to make the right decision, because you will have to vote tomorrow. Um, I'd like to speak to, Hrag, what you were saying about opening these dialogues up to people who otherwise wouldn't be involved. And you say, you know, 14 year olds or young people who are outside the art world and don't know anything who might need to be educated and engaged. I think there's also a role for blogs and people who are in the art world who are already actively engaged but have no voice in a sense. Um, at Art Bag City, we've run for years now. Uh, for a few years now, Image Management, which is a, a series of image essays in the fashion of, say, John Berger, um, by prominent artists who have obviously a role in the art world, but not so much a way to directly deliver their ideas about how, th how things work and how they should work um, to an audience that can then discuss it. And I think also discussion is a major part of this. I've written reviews where the review may have been good, but the comments after the review, the people saying I'm wrong, and me going back and getting in huge fights with them are, is actually more, I think, more educational for a reader and brings things uh, into better perspective. It shows you what's at stake. It shows you, you know, who thinks this and who disagrees in a way that print criticism can't. Um, print criticism by the nature of the publication and the fact that you're publishing one to many uh, dissuades people from lobbying in their own views. And I also think that there's something to be said for the distinction between blogs as, especially in the art world, as a community and blogs as a publishing method. Um, I think that it, it's easy to forget that part of our legacy in a way is whether blogs become an attainable business model. There are very few people blogging about art full time who can pay all their bills just from blogging. Um, it's similar to the situation freelancers have been in for years. That question of making this sustainable is going to affect the quality of criticism. Every day as an editor you face decisions about whether you tell someone to write a review and they go and spend a week writing some long, in-depth, wonderful, theoretical piece of writing, or you give them a news stub and say, write up the story somebody else did in three paragraphs and get a bunch of hits for it. As long as we're worrying about traffic and what's going to bring people in and make us money, frankly, we're going to have trouble making writing criticism, I think, that stands on its own in comparison to print. That's not to say that we're always going to be worse because I think that the dialogues, as I said, that emerge are far more informative um, than reviews can be on their own. But I, I do think we need to address issues about very kind of mechanically, is this going to work? How can it work? Um, you know, is this going to forever be something for dilettantes, for people who have some other job and are blogging, you know, once a week with their thoughts on something, or is this actually going to become something that we can pull together for a while and then actually start keep people in this discussion? While Samantha Kalp from Red Book Studio is going, is preparing to talk, I will present the previous speaker, Will Brandt, editor 
Artifact City, New York. Um, well, thank you to Julia Hrag Will for starting this off. Um, I guess I wanted to speak a little bit about um, where I'm currently working and the, the state of um, art publication online and just the online space in general in China, uh, which has very specific um, different contexts than maybe the rest of the world. And I realize it's unusual. I mean, I think of all places to, to talk about the unique challenges China is facing um, being in St. Petersburg, Russia, I'm sure people also know, uh, have their own perspective on, on what's going on there right now. Um, but for one thing I know who's been um, in the news a lot in the past year is the artist Ai Weiwei. Um, we were talking about him this morning as well and as a really prominent Chinese contemporary artist who has also been a um, critic, an educator, curator throughout his many lives. Um, and the very fact of his presence online in the Chinese internet over the past several years, um, really, you know, which led to his um, imprisonment um, earlier this year and charges being brought against him by the Chinese government for tax evasion. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said about him and I kind of wish even if he was here, um, what he might say, but it, at least in its relationship to um, art, um, China, the online space, and criticism, even if a lot of what his blogging has been has not been um, strictly criticism, although it has included some of that. Um, his blog, his Weibo, which is like Chinese Twitter, because Twitter is of course blocked there, um, and other uh, uh, platforms in the sort of parallel Chinese internet. Um, the very fact of his presence online um, as, a, as an artist, um, as a cultural force, has led to a public discourse about his work, um, art in general, and the role of an artist in society, which is a lot of what um, art criticism um, and art, uh, you know, cultural criticism has to do with, has brought that into the public um, conversation of people who have yeah, very little to do with art, um, as well as those who are experts. Um, I think that would never have happened before, and I think that that's, you know, a very strong case of why at least this type of forum is really important for places like uh, ev everywhere, particularly in China currently. Um, it's something very unique and all, it's interesting even to look at um, Chinese artists of our generation um, who are pretty much across the board. Most Chinese artists are all on their version of Chinese Twitter um, as opposed to I think in the States, Twitter is still something that's maybe used more by writers, critics, people working with new media and technology. Um, whereas even a lot of really respected Chinese um, older art critics, art professors, people sort of from the academy and the traditional institutions are all on uh, Chinese Twitter as well. And sort of seeing that, um, just seeing the possibilities of that as well as of course like the negative part um, and the unique challenges of working in this new space which is um, so different. But I just wanted to say I think you know, the many different internets that are in the world, because they're not all the same, um, this can have a very special function in different contexts. I can see that Claire Solari took the microphone. In this session, she represents the new generation of experts on museum marketing and social networks. Claire is the co-organizer of the biggest world conference on museum marketing that will take place in Metropolitan Museum New York next year. Um, I'd like to really thank Samantha for tackling the um, issue of the internet in itself being a critical space or not. Um, we, during the conversations we had yesterday, um, I heard a lot of skepticism about how the internet in itself could be a place where high standard art criticism could ever take place because of the immediacy of the exchanges and because of the modalities of the exchanges. Um, a lot of people seem to be thinking that it would hinder 
then again, it would lower the standard of criticism. And I just like we, we wanted to add to the possibility of the internet being a space for criticism, a critical space where you can um, express subjectivity and maintain high standards of subjectivity through just the experience that I got. So first of all, as Dennis uh, kindly remembered, I'm not, I'm not like I'm not maintaining a blog on art criticism. Um, what the people I work with are the audiences online, and I've conducted projects engaging audiences online on art, trying to have them speak about like how they feel about art. Um, and the responses that I that I had during the time I was running these projects has been very enlightening for me. On the one hand, I have been in some occasion widely criticized by internet users, by the people on Facebook, by the people on Twitter, when I was building community on a special event for actually not being critical enough, for not using criticism, for not using viewpoints, but for just asking people to engage and how they felt about it. And I had to strongly argue in favor of the fact that both discourses can exist online. You can, you can um, leave a space to subjectivity and most, uh, a lot of very advanced arts institu institutions in the world will do so by putting online extremely advanced curatorial content, a lot of uh, extremely high standard and quality content that creates a lot of stimuli in people. And I don't think everyone was born to be an art critic. So every internet user that comes across uh, an arts platform that offers curatorial content is not going to become an art critic. But there are some stimuli over there, out there on the web that enable people um, to develop a taste. And that obviously doesn't go against education and degrees. That's another way of doing things. So I was widely criticized for trying to replace subjectivity standards with something else. And on the other hand, with proponents of sharing and engaging audiences only, I have been widely criticized because I always maintain that there is a possibility that we can make discourses online, uh, well, that this is possible that these discourses coexist. Criticism and engaging people um, all together. And yeah, I think over the years, this is why actually have surprised me the most, how people are prompt to actually, are craving for authority are craving in the sense of like viewpoints, subjectivity, content, and not that, I mean, it's not, the internet is not only about like speaking your voice and sort of like flattering your own ignorance on art. I think it also gives a strong opportunity for people to develop a critical sense. And that is pretty much the message I wanted to deliver to you from an audience viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. So. Спасибо, Клэр. Микрофон упал в сторону Флоренс Астанд. The microphone fell towards Florence Astand. I think I would like to emphasize what Claire has just been saying, as the fact that there is, there can be uh, in-depth critical writing online, and. Um, I've been running an online publication for two years, which is called Catalog, and it's catalogmagazine.com. And the, this is a magazine which runs between Paris and London. And um, I'm co-editing this um, online publication with Colleen Milliard, who is the um, UK editor of Modern Painters. And I myself work as a curator um, at the Dallas Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, there is something that I would like to first emphasize is that there is always this drastic division we make between the publication online and the printed publication. And 
I just want to say that I think they are like really complementary. The more you work both with them, because I publish online and I publish on printed publication, and the more you write and the more you publish, you kind of realize that if you write a 7,000 words essay on an artist, the chances that a printed publication might be maybe more suited for that kind of essay. And um, there's a lot of new formats of writing that are being created now um, online, um, shorter formats, like for instance, we've been um, doing a lot of um, very short like short paragraphs of people who are talking about a work of art they've seen recently. And that's a short piece of writing that works very well online or interviews. And there, there's a lot of new things to explore in terms of writing. And I'm not only talking about length, of course, but we realized that the more we would publish like very long extensive essay, they, they would tend to be maybe less read than the rest because what's really amazing now when you're doing a publication online is that you can actually see how long someone has been spending reading a page. So you can see if it was three seconds, four minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or like an hour. So you can actually see the impact of what you're publishing very quickly. Where it's being read, is it in India, Canada, is it in New York, is it in Paris, or Vienna? Um, and I think to come back to this complementarity between them, I think we, you both need a publication like Art Info, which gives you a lot of flash and, and what is happening everywhere at every second, but also publication like After All, based in London, which, which also has an online publication, very long essay. Um, you can just look at the way art writers are dealing with the their, their technique of writing, we've been talking a lot about the issue of language yesterday. And I um, remember a like, um, very good art writer called Martin Herbert, who's writing for Freeze. He's going to a show when he has an exhibition review to write, and he has the iPhone with him. And he's almost writing most of his essay while being in the exhibition, which can create a very new form of writing style in terms of exhibition review, and you can actually see maybe um, this kind of format is going to evolve in, um, in a different way. And he's, again, a very good writer um, using those uh, new technique of writings. Um, another point I would like really to uh, emphasize is the, uh, is the problem of fundraising. Um, because when you're running an online publication, it's very, very difficult to convince potential fundraisers that what you're doing is actu actually um, um, rigorous, um, that you're producing in-depth critical writing, that uh, you have uh, an editing board, you have a committee uh, board, you have some translators, we reread the text, we have like uh, a lot of exchange with writers, we pay them, and that we have this kind of professional you know, chain of, of actions that is going on the same way as in a printed publication. And in, in that sense, I would kind of answer to uh, Marek Bertelik, who yesterday uh, were asking what the young generation could expect from the AICA. I think that one of the things that would be very interesting to work together is the way we can convince big institutions uh, about the legitimacy of online publication that would facilitate the way we fundraise our publication. Um, I also. I'd like to come back as well to the question of territory uh, because there is this kind of cliche about the art world being globalized and that everything is the same everywhere and I just want to say I don't agree with this because um, as a curator you travel you travel everywhere during studio visits you meet people in institutions and um, some things are globalized of course but when you're really spending time with artists from um, Tokyo to, um, um, I don't know, London or Texas, where I'm working right now, you see a drastic difference between, I don't know, let's say Houston and Austin, just within the state of Texas. So um, I think it's the same thing that happens with writing and publication. You just want to start with a territory. You just want to start somewhere. And, this, and you just want to start with art scenes that you know very well. And in our case, it was Paris and London, which are centers. Um, but 
when you start publica your publication from a center, two centers, which are Paris and London, then little by little you have to learn how to develop, and I again um, um, refer to um, uh, what Marek was telling yesterday, you try to develop discussion between peripheries. So we were doing some issues that would deal between Marseille and Manchester, between Casablanca and Bristol, between the Paris suburbs and Peckham suburbs in London, and you can create this dynamism. Um, the reason why, I think you always have to ask why you are adding a new publication on the, on the top of the others, why there's already thousands of them and why you want to do it. And I think the reason why we wanted to create that publication is first having a tool for the artists is the reason why we wanted to do it because there's a lot of essays and writings we wanted to do on artists that would be rejected by more prestigious publication that we would also write for. And when the artist is not known yet, it's very difficult to, you know, having your proposal and having it published. So we. It was, in, it was very important for us to create that platform of artists you want to uh, commit yourself with. And in that sense, the curating job and the writing job, I think, is the same in terms of involvement with an artist. Um, and, um, the, and this is, again, this relationship, this double bind uh, concept Andre Dombrovsky was talking about yesterday. Uh, and how in our publication we were really trying to further the uh, format of, an, of the monographic essay. Um, so this is um, uh, one of the things. And of course the job of the art writer is in, in itself. Um, I, I don't know about you, but uh, I know you cannot uh, sustain yourself as just a writer, knowing that most of the time a short review is being paid between 50 and $150. So how many reviews can you write in a week, in a month? Or even if you're writing long essay, how long can you sustain as a freelance uh, um, a writer? Um, so that's something that um, is very important to think about. Last point, and then I'm going to stop there, is the question of language, which uh, I think is very important. And uh, I was really interested in uh, hearing Maxim Cantor yesterday talking how you, what kind of language you can use with your plumber in the kitchen, and what kind of language you're going to use with an art historian. And I think the idea of creating that online publication was that we wanted something free, we wanted something open, we wanted something bilingual, that it would be in all cases both in English and French, um, and also um, trying to um, feed the, f the, the, the field of art history, because we, are, we both studied art history at the Sorbonne and then curating in London at the Royal College. So you're kind of thinking in, when you publish something and when you're running an online publication, how you can kind of move things forward. And one of the fields we've been very active is one, of, is one of exhibition history, because this is kind of a new field that kind of appeared 10 years ago. And it's been 10 years that this field has been very important. So we had this section in the magazine called Exhibition History, where we would, we would invite artists, curators, and writers to remember an exhibition, not a historical exhibition, but an exhibition that they have seen like five or eight years ago. So something that wouldn't necessarily be historical, but something that wouldn't be like a very hot review of something that happened just last week. You can actually do something that is very historical online. I know it sounds obvious, but sometimes it seems there is a confusion uh, with this. So, um, yeah, I think that's it, and we can... Thank you. Thank you, Florence. We still have got two participants of the working group. As far as I understand, the floor is now given to Astrid Vani, the uh, independent art critic and blogger. Can you hear me? Well, actually, I have to confess I'm not like a blogger, even though I'm toying with the idea. Um, I've been invited to participate in this group because I come from both worlds. Um, I have also worked for two years as the editor of an online magazine with the German-speaking Artnet magazine, and I've also always published in print while I was working there. Um, I 
went back to freelancing a year ago because for some crazy reason, just like my colleagues, I do love this. And um, I'm a stubborn person. I do insist on art criticism. And um, I think that art criticism is absolutely indispensable um, in that sense that I don't necessarily see myself as a translator of the artist, as some people were saying yesterday, uh, which I think would be the case if I'm writing in a catalog when I'm kind of asked to explain an artist's work. But um, mostly when I'm doing art criticism, I see myself as a critical person. And I think it's not about translating, but it's about questioning. Um, I think art criticism for me is one of the few areas um, in, in our society where um, you actually have an outlet or where you have a platform for this sort of critical thinking where you can actually take the time and the intellectual space to question what somebody else has been saying and, and to, to necessarily think about um, what you've been told. Um, because there's so much writing in the art world by press releases, by all the museums have like press departments. I think there's actually probably too much um, of like content that's already been produced um, before the critic actually um, comes into the play and before as a critic you can actually see all these things. And uh, one of the problems I see is this certain laziness, it's a lack of time, it's a lack of money, which I will come back to because I think I absolutely agree with you. Nobody ever wants to talk about money, but it's a pressing issue. Um, but because of all these factors, um, I think a lot of art writing consists of rephrasing um, a press release. And um, the job of an art critic, I think, is to actually read the press release and, and look at things and compare them and, and not trust the words that an artist has uttered, but to actually see, is this true? Question this, you know, question everything. Um, that for me is the exciting, um, almost socio-political -politi exercise in art criticism. And having said this, um, it doesn't really matter to me whether I'm publishing online or whether I'm publishing in print. Uh, my content is no different whether I'm doing print or online. Online has certain advantages for me. Um, you've got more space um, with print, particularly with daily newspapers, like I'm writing for Süddeutsche Zeitung, so it happens for me that I've got 120 lines and then somebody important dies and then suddenly I've got 100 lines. But um, because it's so fast, um, I never see my text when they're being edited, so something gets cut off, which was very dear to me. Um, and these are the things that don't happen to you when you write online. And, and I don't think that necessarily the format of the internet um, would produce dumb stuff like you've said. You know, I don't think in that case that the medium actually is the message. Um, it, I actually think it's, it's a great, yeah, it's, it's something in addition, it's something that is much faster and you can produce much more content. Um, I think the outlets for art writing become, even though there are more magazines, especially in the German speaking world, um, I feel that we have less space. Um, the daily newspapers, the national newspapers cut back on these things. Um, art criticism generally kind of becomes more of a kind of art journalist writing and so any, any outlet is welcome. And um, as my last point, sustainability is a major issue. Um, I had a young colleague who was writing for the time when I was editor and there's been one year um, when he actually managed to survive as a freelance writer. And in this year he made something like 16,000 euros, which you can just get by in Berlin if you have a grandmother on top. And um, he produced 180 texts in this year from very short articles to catalog contributions and this is total madness. And um, this is why I made this deliberate decision to find myself an alternative economy. I don't live of writing. Um, I live of writing business but not of art writing and, and that gives me the freedom to choose the kind of art writing I want to do because I don't want to be in a situation that financially um, I have to write any kind of press release, I have to write any catalog contribution even though I don't necessarily um, support that position just because I need the money so I made myself independent of that and I only write about things that I find interesting. Um, but I think nobody ever wants to talk about money and every time I bring up that issue in, in the conversation with the German ICA and I said that to Marek yesterday too, what I would like to see from places like ICA is some kind of lobby support for people you know, who work in art criticism, so that people actually value the work that we're doing, that people see that this is something um, that you should pay for. Um, this is something that comes with the internet, this idea that whatever is published in the internet necessarily has to be for free, which I don't subscribe to, obviously. Um, I have a profession, I'm a trained art historian with a PhD. Um, 
you know, so I have an expertise. I've been running around through art exhibitions since I've been 16 year old, and I'm always saying like, I'm, I'm arrogant and snobbish in this. I want to be paid for my expertise and my time and the years I've been surviving in this crazy beloved world. And um, so, you know, we have to talk about money. We have to talk about how editors can be empowered, you know, how they can actually get support as well so that they can think of like how they pay us writers proper money, how the internet community can get like some sustainability so that this whole kind of art journalism, art criticism world isn't becoming something like that. Everything is for free and we're all just doing it for fun um, because we all have different sorts of incomes or private funds or what have you, that is not true, you know, we're doing a job and um, no one else would ever dream of doing a job perf totally for free, you know, and as I'm saying, I do believe that there's a social necessity, maybe it's, maybe I'm an old nostalgic generation, but I do believe there's a certain necessity for, for the kind of work that we're doing, you know, on, on some kind of even political level. Thank you. Th thank you, Astrid. We still have got one more participant, a professor, Giuseppe Barbiere from the University of Foscari, Venice. And I would like to ask our um, producers to launch a video that will uh, um, make a preface to Barbiere's presentation. I fully agree with the previous speakers. I will be speaking about our university today. This is a university in Venice. You know that Venice is one of the recognized capitals of culture and art in the world. And probably because of that, our university has always paid a lot of attention to organizing exhibitions. We have a lot of exhibition rooms on the Canal Grande, which are constantly used. Now you are seeing uh, the Christian art exhibition. Uh, there's another image of by Naumann of the 1990s. This is the exhibition of Russian art of the 19th and the 20th century that was organized last year. And there's a lot of other events like the Biennale last year. We use uh, those exhibition rooms, and this is an exhibition of Krukov that was closed last month. We use those exhibition rooms to teach the most advanced students to think to work, you see some of the results of our activity. And there, we tell the students about the close relations between the multimedia representation of art and art in general. We've had quite a lot of Russian guests and joined with our Russian colleagues. We've been talking for a long time about the problems that exist on the international level in the area of multimedia, in the area of studies that we could dedicate to art. Naturally, the multimedia materials are necessary to reconstruct certain materials, starting uh, with uh, 1900, a lot of pieces of art were removed from one museum to another museum since the museum started the, to develop. Certainly, every piece of art must find its context. And we think that multimedia materials are the non-invasive techniques that can be used to create a certain message, a certain lighting for uh, the piece of art that we want to exhibit. So naturally, we advise our students and professors to use multimedia to create the content, to create a multimedia content accompanying a piece of art. And to use new technologies 
to refuse from hard copy in it some time. You see the Russian avant-garde art exhibition that is compared to the old icons. Within the framework of that exhibition, we used a lot of multimedia that could involve the spectators into the information that was not only disseminated by multimedia, but through volunteers who worked at that exhibition. So that the visitor could actively communicate with those, say, let us say, materials that were represented in the exhibition. And here you can see the information that we wanted to represent on the situation in the artistic world. We provided information about Russian avant-garde painting of the early 20th century. And the visitors also have at their disposal the multimedia that we used. More than that, one could compare modern art and the icon painting by using our multimedia. Starting with uh, 2012, we will be using the multimedia to provide coverage of uh, one of uh, the masters of antique art, art of the antiquity, which will be like a journey into that art of antiquity, and we will thus involve our spectators and visitors. Thank you. So eight leading experts in the area of internet technologies and art media have just presented their views on the subject of this session. I would ask volunteers, I shouldn't ask volunteers because they are prepared already. In all the aisles, uh, there are volunteers with our kerchiefs. I suspect there will be a lot of questions so whoever raises his or her hand first will get the mic. Yes, Nina Gidashvili was the first. I apologize, but I have a question, maybe not on this subject. When Claire was speaking about certain criticism and about what he is doing. And I would ask all those people who have become transparent for all of the humanities because the blogs suggest a very wide range of communication. How did you feel about that criticism? How what is happening with your internal world? Do you just cast away those negative flows of information? Well, the applause is a great thing, and that is a psychological support. But do you read everything? Do you read all of the derogatory information? Do you? Tell your mother or your neighbors, well, do you say to them, like, they don't understand what I mean. I don't think I'm the only person concerned with the question. Um, I'm going to cut the translation. I'm hearing myself being translated. That's a bit disturbing um, in my own language. Um, so, well, the thing that I found um, engaging people on art projects is that there are, from my own experience, much less criticisms, harsh criticism, and especially insults that you might imagine there is. 
actually the people who engage on art are already people who are selected in a way. They've not been selected by an authority, but they've been selected by their taste of art, their enjoyment, and the will to come and engage with us. Means that generally what we are gonna get is not the YouTube kind of insults that you would have on random videos um, everywhere on the web. We're talking about a complete different level of engagement where people most of the time are trying to be constructive and are trying to engage in a conversation, which would mean because it's not because you're online that you do not respect the rules of engagement of a normal conversation that you would try to not insult people. And I think that again, there's a craving for knowledge. Um, there's a craving for content, for knowing more about the art that I think prevails upon uh, being insulted, which I can safely say I've rarely, rarely been, because also when you respond to people, when you engage, when you moderate, when you're out there, I think people appreciate this. And only for this, for this only, they will most of the time appreciate that you are talking back to them. And this is how I have pretty much solved all the problems that I might have had. So, but that would be for my part. This is not absolute knowledge. So if anyone would like to I'd answer. like to add that um, it also depends on the platform. Um, the types of conversations that happen in the comments of your blog are actually quite uh, intellectual often. And the types of conversations that might happen on Facebook are often less so because maybe somebody didn't click through and read the full link. Maybe they just saw the headline and it's more reactionary. However, you know, on the blog post, they're probably engaging with your full discourse there. And so it can be something a little bit more advanced. Um, I've also had really wonderful conversations on Twitter, back and forth with my fellow writers, with artists, with just general people who jump in. Um, and it also depends on the platform, um, and very rarely is it something that is uh, hostile. Um, I think the last comment I got on a piece I wrote was calling it something like trite and useless. So maybe I have some ground to talk here. I, I think there's a beauty to argument. And I think there's a reason we're sitting here in like a semicircle having a panel discussion where we talk back to each other rather than this being some kind of lecture series. Um, criticism can be very, very harsh. I've, I've been called terrible things. I've gotten emails wishing me luck in my next career. People are mean. But I think that that comes with energy that comes with caring, that comes with having some stake in the art you like being portrayed positively and the art you don't like dying a horrible death and never being mentioned again. And if you don't, if you don't have those biases and you're not willing to fight for them, I'm not sure why you're in this low paid, like, in, you know, stressful career of art writing at all. I don't, I don't understand it. I think you have to like fighting on some level, and if it's occasionally harsh, um, that's okay. Um, I think it helps if you're gonna write about art online to take a course in psychology a little. Um, because, you know, I think it's human nature that sometimes people have a negative reaction to something new, and it could be a new idea. And I think that's actually a good thing many times. Some of our best com long-term commenters or even some of our writers, we discovered because they had really awful reactions to something we wrote. And then all of a sudden, when you talk back to them and you go, well, that's interesting, but I think you're being a little emotional, but this is the reality, here are some facts. You know, sometimes people listen and they go, wait, you know what, maybe I was overreacting. Maybe, maybe there is more to this than just that. So sometimes it, it feels like, okay, as long as you can keep a level head, and when somebody you know, sends you a death threat or says something really awful to you, and it happens, 
um, you just say, okay, you know what, they don't know me, maybe they're at home, maybe they're drinking, maybe, I don't know. You know, I, I have no idea because we don't know what people, where people are when they're commenting. We don't know what they're doing. Um, and sometimes you just step back and give them that room to vent. And sometimes they need to vent and then they think of it rationally. And I think that's important um, because, you know, we, we're human and we have certain emotions and we can't separate those away from our intellectual lives sometimes. I wanted to add to that that the harshest criticism me and my colleagues ever had was actually not from readers. Um, there was very few actually, um, more so when I write online than when I write print. Um, but there was a lot of reactions from the people who we wrote about, like the dealer galleries, more so than the artists. The artists were usually quite grateful for some serious criticism if you did not like a particular exhibition and you could really say so why. Um, whereas it is more the problem of the dealer galleries and I think that leads to another issue in art criticism that I get invited to very few dinners. Um, <laughs> there's a reason why that is. And um, because I'm not known to be the most friendly writer amongst my peers. And um, so I think that you have to be willing to put up with this and also to kind of like not be popular with the people um, who you write about. And you have to be prepared to cook your own dinners at times. Um, you know, because of that system of friendships and, and mates and who knows whom. And I think that is actually the greatest criticism I've always had to face was like going back to a gallery or going back to a place and having people saying like, we completely disagree with what you're saying. Um, also the opposite, people saying we disagree, but we think it's great what you did. Um, but I think generally the audience is usually more appreciative, at least amongst the German readers, usually more appreciative if you do criticize something um, I think they want to see that more than the people who you actually do criticize. I think they have more of a problem with it often. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, all of you. Uh, I would like to pay to attract your attention. Nina, you've asked a very good question. You asked the question of Claire, but everyone thought it necessary to answer it because that relates to everyone. I think we can see more questions here. Maxim Kantor. I have a very naive question, and I really want to check one hypothesis. I've never seen so many internet heroes on one scene. I treat internet with a superstitious fear and respect but my question is, there's a philosopher, Tony Magri, who's, who supposes that the Internet is one of the future forms of the revolution. There is a new stage of liberty and through the Internet. So my question is to you as to uh, the Internet heroes, not the art critics, but through the Internet, as Tony Negri thinks, the masses will acquire a new form of liberty because it's in, the internet is not engaged by the state because the opinions multiply, because it's out of the reach of the government and it's evasive for control. And now we can see a typical example of how internet reaches achieves uh, revolutions in Arab countries. I don't know whether that effect will hold on, but that is possible. I always contradicted Negri, saying that even this form of communication will be engaged by the state, by the government, sooner or later. And this form of communication and the new liberty will be used by people to enter the existing niches and that will increase the number of jobs. That is, in this case, I'm just checking 
this hypothesis, and I'm asking a naive question without any back thought. My question is, do you believe yourselves to be the bearers of the new form of liberty, or you are expecting that the internet will be perceived by the government as something that needs to be engaged. Astrid is talking quite convincingly that this must be paid, but this is work. Yeah, this is this is work, and work must be paid. That's reasonable. That's right. In this case, there is a small contradiction between Astrid's liberty and a desire to be part of the system that pays. To what extent this space between lunch and salary is the real space for fighting? Are you for liberty or for being engaged? Do you want internet to provide you freedom from any party or you expect to be eaten up by the government at some point of time? Because the question was directed to me. Um, you addressed me, I just briefly say that, and I, want, I would love Claire to say that, I would Samantha love to say something about that because she's from China. Um, let's put it this way. When I'm writing art criticism within the context of an art magazine, I want to be paid. Um, if somebody came up saying that I can't do these things, um, that art exhibitions will be censored, um, if my liberty was at stake, I would blog for the hell of my life um, without expecting to be paid. There's a difference in kind of like which institution and which format I actually operate. You know, the one thing is uh, a professional platform, but if we're talking of revolutions, um, you know, I, yeah. I mean, any kind of medium of expression has always been under some sort of surveillance and censorship. It doesn't matter whether you're talking oral speech, freedom of assembly, books, pamphlets, you name it, you know. I mean, the internet for me is um, maybe a more accessible, um, in, in certain countries, a more accessible medium, um, but necessarily um, just as good a medium as, as any other medium um, that, you know, government, it's probably as good as the government um, in the country you live in. I think I should pass on to somebody who's, you know, living in a country that's, you know, where these freedoms are much more at stake than, you know. <clears throat> yeah, just to quickly respond, I guess, to how uh, the first part of the question framing, you know, is the internet the ultimate form of liberty that will never be impeded by government and stuff? I mean, obviously no, <laughs> because okay. I mean, I think probably no, uh, at least where I live. Uh, I mean, and, and even I think um, I'm not as up to date with some of these current things that are before US Congress about and, and, and the EU about, uh, you know, under the veil of copyright and copyright protection, but these things will be IP tracking and whether or not peer-to-peer -peer downloading will continue. And I think we're at a very interesting point. Nobody really knows, but obviously, even at this point, governments, all different governments have been interfering in all different ways with the internet in all different countries. So um, I think I think the basic answer to the uh, philosopher would be no. Um, but I do think what's interesting and even just about uh, what I've experienced and seen in the Chinese context is, um, and maybe for all of this, it's like whatever is gain, you know, we're maybe not in a new completely free place and some of the old hierarchies and some of the old censorship and restrictions and surveillance and everything starts carrying over and forming in a new way in this new space. Um, and I can't say whether it's, it's definitely not uh, totally free um, it's not totally unfree either, and I think there's this, even for the Chinese case of um, Sino Weibo, which is like Twitter in China, that has had, uh, an, you know, unparalleled, um, it's an unparalleled uh, development in terms of Chinese freedom of expression online. It's as free as it's ever been, is on this particular platform. Um, still, on this particular platform, um, because China wants, uh, you know, technologically, it looks, you know, they want to develop these, 
uh, powerful technologies, platforms, um, be seen as a technological leader around the world, so they're not gonna block the platform, but what they actually do is employ, and this has to do with work in a way also, is um, there's something called the 50 Cent Party, or the uh, Mao Party, which is like literally an army of, a small army of people who are, you know, lower working class uh, people who are employed to get a very, very small amount, like less than a penny a US for every comment they delete. So they're literally, it's a manual, it's a human driven um, labor of how the censorship is being done. It's not just through technological means of filtering and stuff. So, but there's a gap between when some potentially sensitive uh, comment is posted or potentially sen sensitive image or news or a link to a New York Times article that nobody likes or whatever it is. There's a gap between when that goes out and then it gets retweeted and repeated um, and disseminated throughout the network on this platform. Um, even then the original posting may be deleted a few seconds later. Um, already it starts to disseminate and then there's, so there's, oh, I think that space and even that amount of time between when the new posting goes online and when it gets deleted, that particular space and however long that is and I guess metaphorically that space could be longer or shorter depending whether you're in a more free internet context like the USA currently or China or even some place that's more restricted than China like Vietnam right now has even more um, internet platforms that are blocked than the Chinese government does. Um, that particular space and how many seconds, how much time there is between the initial posting being deleted and how much time it has to disseminate or even be screen captured and then posted as an image because it's harder to search for the images because there's no text embedded and uh, that represents an interesting space of, of possible freedom and I think looking at that is interesting because it's a very gray area. Um, so that's, yeah. I understand because your censorship, it's also about the economics of it and and I, I want to use a concrete example because I think this is where globalization helps us. Um, in, the, in the case of the Egyptian revolution, well, we actually had a writer, um, somebody I was following on Twitter, who tweeted out that I want to write something, can anybody you know, hire me? And I wrote back and he ended up being a writer for us as a result of this. And he didn't have any, any publications in Egypt or locally that he could publish it. He was a Syrian national living in Egypt at the time. We employed him, and he was the first one to start writing about like discovering that graffiti and street art was appearing after the revolution. People were starting to have a voice on the streets. And I think this is where globalization helps in that he was able to have a New York publication pay him to do the work he was doing um, because there were no other mediums. And we found each other through the internet, and there would be no other way that a publication our size could possibly have a full-time journalist in Cairo covering a revolution that happens. So in that way, we were supporting his work economically, but we were at the other side of the world. And I think the internet offers that opportunity where it's not so immediate, where relationships develop a lot faster they, than they do in print, where often I will hire a writer um, after you know a few hours of talking on the internet, we have a phone call, we talk, it goes really, really quickly. And I don't know any other way to find people unless I was at a cocktail party and I came across somebody and said, hey, why don't you write for us? But this way, it's a lot faster. So the economics there came from him being somewhere that was very volatile. He was in the middle of a revolution. He needed support. And through the internet, we were able to give him that support. So, you know, that's, that's an opportunity that I don't think existed before. The floor is now given to the president of the International uh, Art Critic Association, Mark Bertelli. Well, I have to say uh, I'm very impressed by, by you as a group speaking on, on behalf of all the bloggers, I guess. It's, it's really remarkable, so it's, it's, it's very exciting for me to listen to you. Um, I guess maybe I'm a little bit, well, in age, I'm obviously <laughs> a little bit further up so um, for me, the question nowadays is how I can slow up and how I can gain time when I can think, when I can you know, process information and so on. I mean, it's always, I try to go away in the summer uh, for three months and, and try to stay away from um, you know, the computer and, and, and the TV. And when I go back, actually it's surprising because I feel like I, I didn't miss anything. 
you know, there were so many things happening, and yet it seems like from June to September, uh, there is a jump and, and things keep going. And I get the same information as I got, you know, during that period when I wasn't there. So my question is, uh, do you think that we, we need to chase time, we need to capture time, or maybe we should slow down a little bit and figure out how to, with the media that you use, which is a wonderful medium, I think, uh, that maybe the goal would be also to figure out how to, and it doesn't mean necessarily that you have to shorten your articles, so you know, that that has to be uh, slower in pace or whatever, fewer pictures or less advertisement, but the question is, how do we spend a little bit more time on thinking and less on reacting? So whether uh, you think about those issues, I guess that would be interesting for me to, to hear from you. Can, can I tackle that first? Um, I think that the problem that you're posing is incredibly real and something that I felt personally. And it's important to distance yourself sometimes and to carve out the time for reflection and contemplation to turn off the technology every once in a while. And just because the internet is fast paced and just because it is immediate doesn't mean that we have to function at that pace all the time. It's just, I think that it, you can create silos for yourself and travel between these worlds as opposed to living in just one permanently. Um, and it is okay to walk away from it and to come back and find that everything is still there and still moving along. Um, I think the only real question for me is actually taking the time to see what is happening online, to engage with that and making sure that I'm experiencing the full spectrum of communication available to me today and engaging with it fully um, and not prioritizing one form over the other and just uh, devoting my attention completely to it. Because you really could run yourself ragged trying to keep up with everything happening online. Uh, if I may just comment briefly. Uh, last Friday, I guess, we had this post-Thanksgiving kind of uh, day when people were supposed to rush and shop, right? And, uh, uh, I saw on news today that people actually got killed because they were fighting for, at Walmart, I think, right? Pepper spray. Uh, and, then, and then on the other hand, there was this Black Friday idea, right? When people said, okay, we should restrain ourselves from shopping and we'll, uh, to, this will be our way of also, you know, saying we don't have to shop all the time. We don't have to be active all the time. We don't have to participate. So, uh, so the, the idea for me, it's like whether you also as as very active participants in life, you think that this kind of Black Friday would be an interesting idea when everything shuts down for a day or something like this, and then we catch a breath, and then we continue, and we follow what's going on because it's important. And, you know, I, I feel it has to be very stressful in a way to, to follow up all the time, right? I mean, to be <laughs> aware of what's happening. So maybe with age, you know, you say, okay, I don't have to know, you know, that's good enough. But I understand also that for your generation, it's crucial. And I tell my students, you know, this is the time when you have to network, when you have to do all things, and maybe later you can just select, so. But is there such a concept as kind of Black Friday in your, in your imagination, on e in your consciousness, or whatever it is? Um, I think it's worth uh, saying on the topic of criticism and reviews in particular, that not very long ago, it was entirely normal to publish reviews of shows that had closed. I mean, in print journalism, it still happens all the time. That doesn't happen on blogs. Certainly not blogs whose editors have spoken to. Uh, we've axed pieces because the show was going to go down in you know, four days, and we didn't want the writer spending time on it when it might not attract you know, visitor, or visitors to the website for very long. I think that's one of the real costs of publishing online. And I'm, I'm not entirely okay with it, frankly. Um, I think that, that there was an acceleration when we, started, when we started acting as online editors, and online editors have to do things very quickly, and it's not the same schedule as arts editors, who are themselves certainly not paragons of taking some time out and doing a bit of reading. Um, I think at some point we need to kind of admit that this is just not the format 
the internet is just not the format um, for taking a lot of time to think and then publishing something. It's not what it's good for. It's not a matter of it being bad, it's just you don't use a screwdriver to hammer in a nail. I mean, the internet is good for discourse. We should look to strengthen that. We should look to engage people because the internet is good at that. And I think the issue of, of taking time out is sadly a loss. Uh, I don't agree. <laughs> Um, I think I um, read and write a lot for the internet and I dream a lot about that Friday you were talking about and uh, I think it's an everyday struggle even for my generation to uh, divide one day in a um, sensible way like time to read, time to write, time to go online, time for the openings, time to network time to curate, time to, and at some point you, you don't know how to deal with this anymore. And I think the success of this software called Freedom, uh, I'm sure you heard about that uh, it's a software that is being used more and more by writers now, which you can install on your computer and uh, you ask the software that you want one hour of freedom. It's going to shut down the internet for one hour. And if you want to use the internet again, you have to reboot your computer. That's silly, but so many people are using it to be able to write. And a novelist in the US, I know I've been using it a lot. So I think that's kind of a crucial argument to show that even though we use a lot the internet, we're still struggling with that pace. And um, I don't know if there is an answer to that. I know that, uh, for instance, in Catalog, we decided to publish every three months um, 15 essays at a time. And we realized that pace didn't really work. Um, and it would work much better if every week we just add one more essay and we would send a newsletter to say, here is a new essay, here is a new essay, here is a new essay to read. And um, so I think we're still, I think that um, there is a way to um, slow down and be on the internet at the same time. You just have to have like a crazy discipline uh, to be able to do it. And I think that's a great challenge for us because like dealing with contemporary art and so many shows, you have to train your eye how to filter the good information and, and, and the bad ones. And I think that's an excellent way of filtering the quality of things too. I don't know, that's my answer, I guess. In some ways we're being very polite, I feel like on stage, because there are certain things that the internet does better than print. And, and I think when we talk about art criticism, we're only talking about words. But how about art criticism that comes from video, that comes from photography, from images, from a Photoshop image? I mean, there are different levels of art criticism, and I think online allows that experimentation that print doesn't always allow. Um, if I do a video of a piece and have commentary while the video's going, I mean, that's a form of art criticism. Yes, it's not, you know, the traditional 700 words with one image, but we're, we're trying to experiment with that sometimes and try something a little different. And I think that's something that online does better than print, I'm frankly. And I think video is a perfect example of that because it's easy to produce, especially now with smartphones, it's almost instant. I can upload something within an hour, um, you know, probably create it and upload it about the exhibition in the back of the room. And you're gonna see it within an hour. And print doesn't have that immediacy. And the other thing is we're part of an ecosystem. In, in the world. So when the Washington Post writes something about something that's going on today, guess what? If you're an online publication, they might be quoting you because it's getting out there and they have the opportunity to see it. If you're publishing once a month, you're not going to be part of that conversation in the popular culture. I mean, not to say you won't be in, in academic and in other milieus, but in terms of the popular culture, you're not going to be informing that conversation. Because some, unfortunately, sometimes those conversations in pop culture happen by people that know nothing about art. And I think sometimes, especially in the US we're seeing, uh, we have sometimes religious fundamentalists that show up and criticize an art show. Well, where's the art world saying, you know, hey, you know nothing about what you're talking about. And sometimes the online people are the only people saying that because they're not gonna wait for art forum to publish something two months later because the conversation's over. You know, at least in the pop culture, and I think that's important, and that's something that we can contribute. If I may, 
just to make some enemies. I think we own criticism of video art. I, think, I don't think print has a chance. I think I, I've heard writers repeatedly um, talk about how we don't have a language for talking about a lot of what happens in moving pictures. I've heard that from a number of people. If that's so, the ability to embed a YouTube link to a Bruce Nauman video I want to talk about and say, hey, stop it at 21 seconds. You can't do, th you can't do that in the gallery, much less at home when you're reading you know, a print magazine. I think you're absolutely right that at some point we need to say, you know what? Paper doesn't do it. If we're talking about net art, if we're talking about video art, you're screwed. Like, you can't put in a picture of a video. And when you do, I mean, you pick something that looks kind of nice because you want to make it fit your layout, and you lose the fact that there's 30,000 frames on either side of that picture. And, yeah, go on. On the other hand, you know, if you want to look at a painting, right? Uh, I mean, if you look at the reproduction, you see nothing. I mean, I went to the Hermitage a couple of days ago, and I looked at the Watos and, you know, the, the Ren. And I, I mean, there is no comparison. There is, there is nothing that you can reproduce, you know. And so, so you have those two situations, right? And I think imagination is in the middle. And, and as a good writer, you also are able to convey things that people can see with their imagination, not only with their eyes, you know, and video, because it is so, um, so, so much based on looking and, and sort of following the action, you know, that somehow it, it doesn't, doesn't involve the imagination the same way. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's not a valid medium. It's just a different way of, of interacting with, with the, with the arts and, you know, uh, I mean, when I went to the Hermitage, I stood there and I said, I, 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 I don't know how I can tell my students, you know, what I saw, but I will try at least. And no, my students, oh, it's, it's funny, it's a little digression, digression, but I think it makes sense. They, they say, we don't know when you are telling the truth and when you lie, because, you know, and I say, oh, oh my gosh, this is horrible. You know, at least I teach art history and then they don't know where truth ends and when things. But on the other hand, it's a compliment, I think. You know, I, I imagine things and I let them imagine. And as artists, they should imagine. And I assume a large part of your audience is, is uh, it's, it's artists or people who are interested in looking at things. Yeah, I, I think you have a point. I don't mean to mean in any way the fact that we've the fact that we can communicate about paintings and writing at all is pretty fantastic I mean daubs of oil on a, a piece of cloth somewhere and I can describe it to you as an art critic and we have this vocabulary we can actually communicate something that's crazy but at the same time now that we're dealing with infinitely reproducible media being used in art context the fact that we haven't infinitely reproducible medium for our publishing. I mean, I think there's something to be said for that. Dear colleagues, I'd like you to include into your dialogue uh, your colleague from Russia, art critic Valentin Diakonov. Yeah, art critics Valentin Diakonov. Speak in English. Uh, thank you for coming. It was very interesting to hear about what you all were talking about. Uh, different topics, but I want to focus on the uh, navigating experience. When someone is subscribed to many blogs and someone is subscribed to many newspaper pieces, all that stuff. I think from my perspective, we uh, are all drifting towards, towards uh, reading people, not blogs. I pay for my New Yorker subscription because I need my monthly dose of Peter Sheldahl and I want to be sure that I get it because not of all of his uh, articles are online. I don't read artinfo.com, I read Ben Davis. I don't read New Yorker magazine, New York magazine, I read Jerry Jer 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 Results. And uh, this is a model that is close to the Facebook experience actually. We're conversing with people and I as a reader also read people, not blogs. And that got me thinking about two things. Uh, there must be a internet, specific internet form of, uh, you know, uh, communication, um, a, a genre, if I may say, because there's no, uh, I'm, against, I'm against fetishizing the academic discourse. If 
you want to write an academic article, you, you have a hammer and you have to nail it in the heads of your academic publication close, close to you. Um, what, is, what is the form of a post in the internet that is uh, really off, that, that is really born of the internet as a structure? What do you think is the most effective form of an article, a post, or anything? I'm Craig, I'm a big fan of the 10 least influential people in the, or how many uh, that feature. And I think it succeeds in itself because it is, uh, it is close to what the internet was all about way back. A, a number of links, a top of something, top 10 of something. So I want just to ask you what do you think of the, you know, the most perfect form of internet posting? Paralyst 20 uh, that you mentioned that we posted. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. But Paralyst 20, yeah, it's, I think, I think the key for an internet post is it, and I think this is unlike print, in that it has to have really good images of some sort. There needs to be a visual element. I mean, when we're talking about art, we have to recognize that the visuals are really important, you know, and, and I think that's a key. If you want something to go viral online, and we've had a number of posts go viral, there has to be something really good to look at, you know, and I mean more than just the words. The words are augmented and are a part of it, and there's a symbiotic relationship between the words and the text, but the image is really important. And I think, you know, and I think sometimes as art critics, we forget how important images are in our own writing. And, you know, I think, I, I mean, when I went to uh, art history, you know, when I studied art history, you know, I wasn't really taught how to choose the right image all the time. I wasn't taught that maybe, you know, you should uh, post this video or, you know, this kind of image. I mean, images, it was almost like taken away. We had slides, but we just, we didn't, we weren't really taught that visual literacy in the same way that, hey, maybe this image is going to tell your point a lot better. It's not just a perfect picture of the painting. Maybe you should crop it because you're talking about this part. You know, it's like there are these, there are the different kinds of things, and I think online highlights that. Can I also tackle that question? I don't know if a perfect post exists. Um, one of the things about the internet is that these models are still developing. We are all still experimenting. And I'd also question you how you would measure success. You know, is a successful post something that communicates most effectively to your audience? Or is a successful post one that gets the greatest number of page views? Because if you're looking for page views, there is a specific model that you might want to try out. Hiddens. Page views? <laughs> um, the, the, the model, the model for page views is kittens, right. obviously. Right, kittens, yeah, we were just talking about that. Kittens, um, lists are really popular. Lists, yeah. Yes, um, image galleries. I mean, but, but those are all kind of tools and tricks for, for bringing an audience to your site. And then what you do with them and how you communicate with them there is an entirely different story, in my opinion. Yeah, we're totally subscribed. Hello, Valentin, by the way, we have worked together. You were our Moscow correspondent yeah, for yeah, a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very nice to meet you. I'll have a coffee with you later on. Um, so yes, I totally agree. I mean, there is this thing like, do you want to click? Do you want to be found on Google? You know, do you want to have to bring in the keywords so that your article is ranked very high? Um, from our experience from monitoring people, the shorter the better, and mostly images, and that leads me to the question I actually wanted to ask you, because in Germany we have very big problems with publishing images. When I was working with Artnet, um, there was like an agreement between the company and between a German system, which I can't translate into any other language, which is something like a copyright holding system, so anything, if I publish something online privately and I want to take a picture out of a art gallery, um, I can only do it for a certain amount of time, then I have to take it down. And um, that was the fantastic thing, as you said, about the space. We could basically take as many pictures as we wanted and just like, because of that agreement, just bring in like any individual artwork plus some installation shots. But what about you guys? I would really be interested in how do you do about copyright systems, how images, YouTube, embedding, and so on and so on. We have one big advantage in the US, which is fair use 
Um, fair use is, fire, is, is in the, written in the Constitution. And I'll tell you, you know, try to sue me. I will fight back. Because, the, you know, fair use says that if you're criticizing something and you're actually talking about the image, you actually have the right to reproduce that. You know, so, there, so that, that's a right. I mean, they could, I mean, companies can sue you and try, you know, but the truth is, you know, there's, there are certain liberties that we've won and they're, they're fought. And in the 21st century, one of the biggest battlefields, and I think you're all going to fight it, everyone in this room to a certain degree, is copyright. We're all going to fight the war of copyright. And that means, and I mean, some countries have really choked copyright. I mean, I, 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 was, I grew up in Canada, and I'm a Canadian, but I'll tell you, Canada's copyright laws are awful, in my opinion. You can't even take pictures in museums, you know, and I, I think that's ridiculous. You know, why should I not be able to go into a museum and share a wonderful image with people? And if anything, I'm giving them, more, I'm giving them free publicity, you know, and, and, it's, and I think that's something you're just going to have to fight for. And, you know, hey, you want to sue me? Go ahead. Did anyone try to sue you? They haven't tried to, though often people will ask us to take images down. And unless they have a really legitimate reason, like for instance, in the case of Ai Weiwei, somebody asked us to take something down because they didn't want to be, um, you know, they didn't want the Chinese authorities to go after them. And so then in that case, you have to weigh it. And you have to say, well, is there, you know, their personal safety is at risk? That's different. Uh, another question, just one last question. What do you think, uh, this is addressed to Hrag, basically, but to all, maybe somebody else. What do you think of the fact that artinfo.com just bought a bunch of blogs and made them <laughs> part of their publication? They don't pay them. Oh, okay. They don't. And I mean, Huffington Post does the same thing. A lot of their bloggers do it for free. And let me tell you, I think as an art writer, you should not be giving your writing away for free. And if you do that, you should be doing it for your own personal blog. You know, why should you be propping up somebody else's brand for that? We pay all our writers, you know, we pay all our contributors because that's one of the things. As a writer, I think we should get paid. I mean, even if it's small, I think there's a different level of respect someone has. You know, and I think you're less likely to publish crap if, if, it's, if it's, you know, if you're being paid for it. Otherwise, who cares? You know, and I think that's a really bad idea to, like, you know, write for someone else for free. So, this is depressing. I thought that they pay the bloggers. I mean, uh, that's, that's what I was talking about because I think that the Facebook model of uh, uh, navigating through web is the only model. I mean, I will pay for a good critic, to read a good critic. That's all. That's the basics of this. And this is the question about money also. I want to read this person, what he, what he or she has to say, I will pay. It's simple as that. I think it's also worth saying that blogging is, I think, at root very closely tied to your personal identity. I don't read Art Info blogs, as you were saying. I read Kyle Shekha's blog because it's excellent and he happens to be doing it at Art Info. I think that what Art Info has done is to take a number of writers who are writing independently already and give them kind of a centralized platform. I, I'm not sure that the fact that it's all on artinfo.com has anything to do with the success or failure of these blogs. And I think that even things like their layout design, which clearly does not privilege uh, the titles of authors, um, I, I think it's clear that they're not trying to build names for their bloggers in the same way that bloggers independently, like Krog or myself or Patty Johnson, who founded Artfexity, I mean, we're about building name recognition. I'm not sure that what Artinfo is doing is doing that, and I'm not sure if people will be able to move past that uh, in the same way that they might be able to if they had their own blog. I, I think we'll see. Thank you very much. And we have one more question from Jennifer Francis. Hi. It's really just a, to punctuate a point that was made earlier on. You started to talk about copyright. And while it's accepted that it's something that could change as we move forward with the internet experience, I just wanted to say from an institutional perspective that often with loan exhibitions, part of the agreement is that we can only use the imagery 
um, that has been provided in terms of uh, um, paintings, etc., that we are exhibiting for a period of time. And so we have to then put those restrictions on any publication that you can only use it for review and crit, because that is the, the permissions that have been granted to us. And also there are many artists, there's one in particular that we're working with in the UK, who um, obviously for their own monetizing purposes, they don't want their images to just be out there ad infinitum and anyone being able to use them. So I accept it's a bigger debate, it's going to run for some time, but there are legitimate reasons as to why you just cannot use imagery again and again and again when you want to. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello. Um, I respect that, but I also, um, I also will fight that battle because I, at the end of the day, you know, I have actually walked out of exhibitions when they didn't allow me to take photographs um, and said, sorry, then I'm not going to write about it because I think as an art critic, sometimes my subjectivity doesn't just come from words, it comes from photos. I mean, we ask our writers to take their own photos most of the time and only when the photos aren't very good, sometimes we go to the stock photos. Um, but it's, I think it's part of that. It's part of seeing, and now especially with, with cell phones and things like that, we're used to people seeing things in different ways. And okay, if the reproduction isn't so good, that's all right, we're still seeing it in different ways. And I understand the legal agreements, and I understand artists asking to control their image and all those sort of things, but I don't have to agree with it. I mean, just like any form of criticism, just because it's in a press release doesn't mean it's true. I mean, I could disagree with that. And I choose to sometimes not do that. No, absolutely. But that's why most institutions also will have press days when you or your colleagues can come in and you can take pictures and then they issue images afterwards. And of course, there is going to be agreements and disagreements. I just wanted to put it on the record exactly why this happens. Uh, a small note to our dear work group because of increasing quantity of questions, I would ask you to choose only one person to, to, to reply to who will reply to Jennifer. We have one question. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm the author of the project that discriminates the authorities. Yes, I would like to hear today about criticism. When does a critic talk to the artist like a soul speaks to a soul? Maxim Cantor actually stole my other question. First, I had a great superstition about the internet on the level of intuition. Now, I'm sure now that this fear had a reason behind it. We have to repeat, but our country is very politicized. And what happened in Arabic countries is not a single example. It has to do with all of us and what the internet did with the young people, with the old people, was terrible. I believe you have to be you have to be very careful with those blogs. And there was an exper a bad experience. And I don't think the U.S. should impose their concept of li liberty and their understanding of uh, the artistic values. Do the U.S. try to become a, a world policeman in the world of arts? We have our own traditions. We are an Eastern country. We have Yuri Shevchuk. There is the group DDT who once said, revolution 
You've taught us believe in kindness. Just remind me. You believed, you made us believe kindness was always right. But how many people do you burn on your pyres? You are the young people. I was born in 1955. Look at how my contemporaries are. You should be very careful to each other. Today, criticism must talk to the artist's soul. I'm sitting here among so many good and kind young people, but I understood. I'm tired of words, or like Sartre said, words, words. And you will be tired of that video fairy tale. Thank you very much. I think that doesn't need a comment. You were, you were talking about your generation. We have a question from the younger generation, the young person in the back row. My name is Konstantin Favilov. I'm an artist. And I have a question about the filtration of criticism. There's a lot of criticism on the internet thanks to the liberty. And everyone expresses their ex everyone expresses their opinion. But for young artists, the process of selection and filtration is very difficult because there is so much information coming to a person that has not yet been formed. And the person becomes very anxious and finds it difficult to find what he is. So uh, should that selection be done by the artist himself, or should it be a function of the internet? So the question is, how does a young artist develop those filters through which the criticism comes? Because so much information is coming to him. Uh, many people have, many of you have excellent art education, but th nowadays the art has become less academic and many people do not have that education. They do not understand what the critic says and uh, people could not understand whether the critic is saying meaningful things uh, to him or her, and uh, how does he achieve that filtration, the question is. Well, I believe that we will finish with that question, and we will get a response, and we will break for lunch now. Can, can I maybe answer both things a little bit? Um, so for a start, I mean, I'm the only uh, one of the few, I mean, we're a couple of old Europe and a couple of United States, and um, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding going on if somebody gets the impression that, and I think I'm speaking for all of us, we're trying to advocate a particular model, a particular art, a particular sort of criticism. I mean, I, I do publish both in English and in German, but I mean, I... I can only speak of myself and um, I do miss the Russian voice I mean I wrote my PhD thesis on Kummer and Melamit and I certainly know my for a German perspective I know my um, unofficial art history from Russia and I dearly miss um, I really miss something coming from here and um, when I'm writing about this I do this at the perspective of an art historian and not as an art critic and um, as I said, I don't necessarily see myself as a translator when I'm a critic, when I do write more historical texts or when I write a feature that is definitely more of a translation um, than um, a criticism. On the other hand, in my profession, there are ethical limits, like how close you can be to somebody. Um, you know, I would never ever write about people who I'm personal friends with, that is out of the limit, or at least I have to inform the editors um, about how well I know somebody, so there's a limit to this kind of like, you know, closeness you can actually have with somebody in, in my profession, and I think this is very important for me, 
to stick with those standards um, so that nobody can say I'm writing something in favor of somebody else. And I think the same goes for young artists. Um, I would always measure an artist against what he or she is saying and doing. And um, I would never ever um, touch somebody in a harsher way who's like super young or inexperienced or first steps. Um, but if somebody um, comes up like a super hyped art star and getting like an institutional exhibition in Berlin and I think what the press release says has got nothing to do with what I perceive and it's like a whole lot of, you know, um, conceptual kind of like blah blah and, and, and they're trying to sell me something as the latest star, I think I do have the right to question this and say hang on a minute, I don't see what you're saying, what you're doing. So I think there's different levels also in the terms of like how how I see my own profession and the kind of texts I'm writing and, and, and the different roles I do have to do um, to kind of like make at least a certain impact on things and I am kind of quite schizophrenic whether I'm writing as an art historian or whether I'm writing as a critic and I think that different kind of ethical rules apply um, you know in terms of like how as I'm saying like how close you can be and, and how you judge people. I think I think the question was about how young artists filter the mass of information that is coming online and how you can make a selection um, with all the things that are getting published. And I don't think there is an answer to that because that's the same issue that we all are going through, how you're going to select that content. Um, but one of the things I would just... Um, see from my experience is that um, from the young generation of artists, they tend to uh, group together and gather, um, not necessarily as collectives, but um, as groups of people that um, maybe organize um, exhibitions or uh, their own publications. And I think that that uh, energy of gathering is, as becoming, is becoming extremely important as a kind of um, a counterforce to kind of help to select that content as a group. I, I don't know if that's clear, but that's how I um, see the artists, uh, young artists trying to select that content. To Thank you very much. kind of add on that really briefly, I would say that it's also a question of trust. Whose opinion do you respect? Whose opinion do you read? What do you value? Um, I'm sure that you are already reading critics online, and if they happen to write about your work, you'll probably uh, put more stock into their opinion than someone else who you've never heard of before. Um, you're probably already part of these communities and already have maybe a distant but some sort of relationship with these writers, and you would pay attention to the ones who, whose opinions you trust and value. We have another question. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I will try to be very brief. It's very interesting to hear your opinion because one can feel the energy and the expansion of art criticism impact on the social opinion through the internet. Do you feel that this impact is already seen in the practical practice of modern art? Do you believe that the art criticism in the internet will further impact modern art? Will, please. Um, I think just to take um, an obvious example, William Pohaida is a contemporary artist in New York who was a critic, wrote online, is now making works about arguing on the internet and criticism and art criticism. Sorry, C could you please? Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I think he's very clearly an artist uh, who's not only being influenced by art criticism online, but is actually making work which takes that as its subject. Um, moreover, I think my interests and, and where a lot of my writing lies is in net art. And I know net artists um, are very active in 
these back and forths online and are very aware of, of criticism. I think that's a field that's naturally going to be more attuned to art criticism online. I think the openness, the new openness of critics has been very refreshing for them and it's really helped in establishing this discourse that I think is very soon going to become a history. Thank you. Will Brand from Artfuck City. And probably the last question, uh, Milena Orlova, art critic. Milena Orlova, the art critic. And I will personally come up to you to give you a mic. I'll try to be brief, because evidently everyone is uh, itching to get some lunch. I wanted to uh, intervene into this conversation a little earlier, but I didn't have a chance. With great interest, I was listening to everyone speaking from the stage, uh, Valentina Diakonova, and uh, I fully agree in, on ma majority of things with our guests, but I have still one uh, um, thought. For uh, 20, uh, for 12 years, I've been working as a newspaper critic in a commerçant newspaper in Russia. And uh, now I've uh, logged in Facebook, and I don't consider that to be my part of my work or some professional engagement or professional activity, but uh, amongst my friends, there are so many artists, and since a professional network, it happens so that in your uh, social media, you uh, discuss uh, some art artistic uh, things, artistic problems. If in the newspaper my position was abstract, I was speaking on behalf of the newspaper, I couldn't feel that it was my personal opinion. But if you compare that to the social media, then you get this problem, and uh, Viola talked about that, that it's a very personal story. And uh, it's interesting that all my friends uh, are interested in uh, what's not for print, so to say. So what's behind the curtains, what's behind the lines, uh, what's behind the critic text. And I have read on this forum yesterday that my friends were interested in a story how to get to this forum, because my friends were discussing a very tight security system in this forum, and one of my colleagues was left behind because he had some problems with his documents. And that triggered a huge reaction, and not the stuff that is being discussed, like the theories or practices or philosophy or anything else. Even more, one other problem appeared, and I formulated it for myself right now. I call it a friendship censorship. Since uh, Facebook community is a closed community and those people I talk to are my friends, with all, well, I cannot offend them. Uh, the ability to offend them limits my abilities as a critic. On the other hand, it allows me to move on to a more personal contact level uh, to really cite some stories. Well, for me, it's a paradox. I don't know whether you have encountered this situation or not. And here I'm talking about closed communities, uh, narrow communities, and both professional communities. I think it's a new reality. You have friends who are your colleagues at the same time, and I really don't know how to act. Either I could publish only images, and that will not be interesting because everybody asks for your opinion. My question is as such, and do you have this problem of friends? Thank you. I, I definitely think there's a problem when it comes to friends. Um, we don't have as strict of a policy about that. I'll, I won't write about somebody I know. For instance, I will, but I'll always mention it, or I'll always bring it up, or there will always be that. I have offended friends, because frankly, friends get offended. Um, it happens, and you're right, but I think in this, in this um, case, it, the more open your network, the more chance for success in a lot of ways. Um, because you have to open up, this is an audience. I think if you're going to open up, and I, and I think Facebook's a little different, because we have to acknowledge that Facebook is a closed system. It's a walled garden, as they say. So you can't control that conversation. I mean, you control it, I mean, the opposite. You control the conversation as much as possible. But on something like Twitter, for instance, it's an open conversation. And there's no way to control it. If, everyone, if somebody in this room does something with the art grit hashtag, that is completely offensive to all of us on the stage, we can't say, I'm sorry, you can't say that. 
so I think, but that's the benefit. It's like the more open, I mean, frankly, as an online publication, I want more readers, not less. You know, I, I'd, like, I'd like more people to be involved. Um, at the same time, I'm not gonna allow you to say something incredibly offensive, but if you don't agree with me, that's fine. I don't think I'm God. I mean, I, you know, I, I've made mistakes, that's fine. And I think if, if you accept that, uh, then, you know, you're ready for this type of criticism, this type of online engaged criticism. Oh. Julia, do you have anything to add before we quit? The question of friends. Um, I've actually written about friends before, and it is really hard to be objective. Um, I do think that it is important to disclose your relationship with people. Um, but I think the question of a critic, whether you're writing online or in print, is to not be afraid to voice your opinion, no matter of whom it may offend. And that extends to friends as well. And, you know, if they really are very good friends who are also colleagues, they will understand the nature of your profession. Um, to me, it's been very beneficial to develop personal relationships with colleagues and with artists through Twitter. I actually tend to keep Facebook much more private, and I'm much more selective about who I allow into that circle because that is a place where I'm much more likely to express my opinion. And, you know, I probably won't add an artist who I've met passingly at an exhibition into that sphere because I don't want that type of relationship with them in that space. Um, but, it, for example, on Twitter, I make connections with artists all the time, and it actually grants me greater access to them. You know, somebody publishes uh, a new work, and I spot it on Twitter, and I email them or send them a message instantly requesting an interview, and they grant it. And it's, it's that type of uh, professional relationship that that medium allows that I'm actually really invested in. Facebook for me is more a place for friends and family, and maybe I might not write about an artist who I've let into that close inner circle, because it's, it's a different tenacity of the relationship there. Thank you, Julia. Mm -hmm. Thanks to all of our work group. Uh, and the last question of Yelena Arlova draws a line. Uh, a bottom line of our session that is dedicated to new media and uh, social networks. I'm pretty convinced that the esteemed participants of, of this working group will become online friends. They will friend everyone who has gathered in this room. And all other questions and any further conversation could be continued on a uh, online venue. And as an announcement, we're coming back to this room at 2 p.m. sharp, at 2 p.m. sharp, to listen to Jennifer Francis, the head of press and marketing department of the Royal Academy of Arts, London, and also Maxim Kantor. Thank you.